So for, for the purposes of today, it'll be enough to start with a, a single vector space V over some field, which will usually be the complex numbers or, or some rational functions over the complex numbers. And an R matrix will be some uh, rational valued endomorphism of the tensor square of V. Or another way we can think about this is by putting each vector space into some family of evaluation representations. So I just tensor width with fields over some formal parameter. And we want to think of the R matrix as, as some, uh, some matrix depending on the difference of two evaluation parameters. And an R matrix will be a solution to, to the Yang-Baxter equation. And so, so this Yang-Baxter equation will consist of three R matrices composed in, in the opposite order. So first, I'll have uh, three R matrices like, like this, and here R12. acts, um, yeah, let, let's, let's say this will be some equality of operators that acts on a tensor product of, of three copies of this vector space. And here, this acts in just the first two tensor factors. And similarly, R13 acts on the first and third tensor factor and leaves the second tensor factor alone, and so on. And so I can compose these three operators, or I can compose them in the opposite order. And the Yang-Baxter equation tells me that these should be the same operators acting on this triple tensor product. Okay. And so pictorially, this can be drawn as follows. I have my first two vector spaces interacting, then I have my second and third, and then I have my first and third. Or I have these interactions in the opposite order. So this is this picture of Reitermeister 3. So if, if V is finite dimensional, this is a pretty hard equation to solve. There's um, the dimension of V to the sixth power equations in, in uh, dim V to the fourth power unknowns. And so if you have a solution, that's a, that's a pretty powerful thing. Here's an example of a solution. So I could take my, my field kappa to be, take my field K to be rational functions and some variable kappa. And one example would be the following, acting on, say, the tensor product of C2 with itself. And so it's an exercise, uh, not a hard one, to check that this indeed satisfies the Yang-Baxter equation. And when our matrix will just be a solution to, to the Yang-Baxter equation. Okay. So algebraically, these arise as the uh, non-commutativity constraints of uh, quantum group representations. 
And so if I have a quantum group to it, I can associate an R matrix that tells me uh, the failure of the tensor product of representations of this quantum group to be non-commutative. But the construction also works the other way. So if I have an R matrix, then from this R matrix, I can produce a quantum group. So in this way, I start with the representations and some way to, to um, braid them. And from there, I, I produce a quantum group. And so that's called the quantum inverse scattering method. So starting with some, some R matrix, the quantum inverse scattering method. Due to Fedeyev, Reshetinkin, and Taktajan. Produces a certain Hopf algebra, a quantum group, Y, called the Yangian. And this quantum group acts on arbitrary. tensor products of this representation. Okay. And so let me briefly kind of re review how this, this algebra comes about. I'll give some very, very quick sketch. Um, so, so generators of Y can be read off from, from matrix elements of R. So, so more specifically, these are operators appearing in matrix coefficients of R or, or compositions. of this R matrix. So for example, if I have some endomorphism of V, then the generators can be read off as coefficients of the following operator. I take the trace over V of phi applied to the first factor of some long tensor product of V, and then I apply this R matrix however many times I like. And so this, and here is some operator that acts on V via view tensor this V to the UI, tensor n copies of this V. If I take the trace over this first factor, um, or I guess I called it the zero with factor, then I get some matrix valued series in U and I want to take the coefficients in, suppose I normalize these R matrices so that R of infinity is one, then I want to take the coefficients in the one over U expansion. Of this operator here. And these will give me the generators of my Yangian. So again, this, this formula is not particularly important to internalize right now. I just say it to give you some sense of, of how this algebra comes about. Um, some relations among these generators, not all of them, but, but some can be read off from the Yang-Baxter equation. And so, for those familiar, these are these are called the RTT relations.
And the resulting algebras are, are familiar and show up in other contexts. For example, for this example I, I wrote down earlier, for this Yang R matrix that was 1 minus kappa over u, 1, 2, the resulting Yangian is what's called the Yangian of GL2. And so this is some Hopf algebra deformation of the universal enveloping algebra of GL2 valued polynomials. And, and these are studied from many different perspectives. For example, one can write down explicit generators and relations. Um, this was first introduced by, by Drinfeld and, and uh, studied by many people. Chari Presley, adding up Sh uh, Shadler Schiffman, Molov, Nazarov, Olshansky. There's, there's lots of uh, work on these Yangians. So from the R matrix, one can not only read off this algebra, but, but other special properties of this algebra. So for example, the R matrix also gives rise to families of commutative subalgebras. Of the Yangian. And these are called Baxter subalgebras. So if I have some <laughs> operator on my vector space that commutes with the R matrix in the following sense, then the resulting operators I get from doing this construction end up commuting. So it's a kind of fun exercise to show that the resulting operators can use. And so in this way, I produce a com family of commutative subalgebras for every such operator, phi. So for example, of this, this Yang R matrix, I can take this matrix V to be multiplication by any element of uh, GL2. And to this G, I would associate some commutative subalgebra of this union. So this is the, the general algebraic package one can produce given these R matrices. And, and we'll talk about today how to produce this, this algebraic package using geometry. And so this, yeah. Uh, so is this Yangian actually depend on uh, the choice of phi? Does it depend on the choice of phi? So, so the one can pick, one, one picks any, at least here, one picks any phi a finite rank. And all of these phi produce generators that go into the Yangian. So, so the, the, gen, the generators, so, so I pick all my phi. For each phi, I get some generators. And all of these generators appear in the Yangian. So, so yeah, the answer is no. <laughs> um, OK. And so this kind of line of study was, was initiated by Malik and Kunkov, who produced R matrices from the geometry of Nakajima quiver varieties. So this is a pretty extensive theory. Instead of Going through it in all this generality, let me just focus on a few examples.
so here are some examples of Nakajima quiver varieties. If I start with just a quiver that's, that's a point, no loops or anything, and I frame it, Then the corresponding quiver variety is, wait, I'm all turned around here, I apologize, like this. And the corresponding quiver variety is the, the cotangent space to the Grassmannian of Kn. And so if in particular I take n to be 1, then well, the cohomology of x is just what? It's the cohomology of two points. And I'll set this to be my, my v. And so if I'm working over c, this just is uh, this c2, which we've already seen. And how do I get these tensor products geometrically? I just take larger n. And so if I take equivariant cohomology, for some fixed n as k varies, then this turns out to be isomorphic. to the tensor to an n-fold tensor product. And here, the, these uh, evaluation parameters correspond to the equivariant parameters of the torus that acts on the Grassmannian. And so this produces uh, this, this kind of C2 vector space that we've seen in this earlier example of, of Yang's R matrix. But of course, one can do this for more complicated quiver varieties. So here's a slightly more complicated quiver variety. One can take the Nakajima quiver variety associated with the Jordan quiver, so I, I double that quiver and, and frame it. And the corresponding variety is instanton moduli space. M and R of torsion free frame sheaves. On P2. And so here R is, is the rank, and N is the second churn class of these sheaves. And so in particular, when, when R is 1, one recovers the, the Hilbert scheme of points that Lotar talked about yesterday. So this is equal to the Hilbert scheme of N points on C2. And One has some torus whose equivariant parameters I'll call T1 and T2 that acts on uh, so P2 or, or C2 here. And that gives rise to an action on the moduli space of, of sheaves on P2. Yep. So it's framed, so, so the first turn class is automatically zero. And the vector space I want to associate is the union over all Hilbert schemes of, of uh, C2. And so unlike our previous examples, now V is infinite dimensional. And, and just like in this picture, I, I can produce tensor products of V by increasing the, the size of the framing.
And a similar idea holds for, for an arbitrary Nakajima variety. By increasing the size of the framing, I can produce, produce tensor products of, of what I get for the simple framings. So you're saying this, this V here? Yeah, so this is, um, I'll say this in a little bit, but this is a Fox space for, for the Heisenberg algebra. Yeah. So in this level of generality, Malik and Akunkov construct R matrices. And, and this, they do this for an arbitrary Nakajima variety, and, and they do it using special Lagrangian correspondences called stable envelopes. So in the interest of time, I'll, I'll kind of omit a detailed explanation of these, but let me just say from, from the geometric properties of these correspondences, the Yang-Baxter equation follows immediately. So most of the work goes into constructing these correspondences, but once you have these correspondences, Yang-Baxter is pretty much just a formal consequence of, of properties of these correspondences. And, and another consequence of the stable envelope construction is that vacuum matrix elements, so, so certain vacuum matrix elements can be written, so vacuum matrix elements of the corresponding R matrices can be written in terms of tautological bundles. So let me just say what the tautological bundles are in this example of, of the Hilbert scheme. So if I have, so, so on, on the, the Hilbert scheme, there's not so many different choices of tautological bundle. What I, what I uh, associate is given some some uh, subscheme Z of, of C2, the, the fiber should be just sections of, of the structure sheep of this subscheme. And this gives rise to a rank N vector bundle over the Hilbert scheme of points in C2. This is what's called the, the tautological bundle. And given quiver varieties, I have uh, similar bundles, one kind of sitting over every node of my quiver. So what do I mean by two, for, for example, if I take this matrix and I restrict it to, say, the, the vacuum, which I just defined to be the cohomology of the Hilbert scheme of zero points on C2, which is just a point, tensor with the cohomology the Hilbert scheme of endpoints on C2, and I expand this matrix element here, it 
in, in powers of 1 over u. What I get is some constant. But then as soon as I go to the 1 over u squared term, the tautological bundles begin to appear. And so on. And so what are, what are the Yangians one obtains? So I told you anytime you have an R matrix, you get a Yangian. This example of the tangent space to Grassmannians, this gives rise to this Drinfeld Yangian of, of GL2 that acts on, on cohomology of the tangent space to Grassmannians. And so this recovers a construction of uh, Varaniolo or uh, Nakajima in the kind of corresponding construction in K-theory. But if one instead starts with instanton moduli space, one gets a larger algebra. One gets what can be called the Yangian of uh, GL1 hat. So this is some Hopf algebra deformation of double loops in GL1. That is to say, of Heisenberg algebra valued polynomials. Um, and, and this was shown by, by Schiffman and Vassaroa to be isomorphic to the, the cohomological Hall algebra associated to the same quiver. And in general, starting with, with any quiver variety, one gets some yang yin. And, and um, in kind of, especially in affine or, or wild types, these algebras are quite big, but they turn out to be just the right size for enumerative applications. So I mentioned not only does one get a Yangian action from, from these R matrices, but if you can find operators that commute with the R matrices, then one gets uh, Baxter subalgebras. And so let me focus on the example of the Hilbert scheme. So given some complex number Q, I can define an operator V of Q that acts on the cohomology of, of the Hilbert scheme of endpoints in C2 by Q raised to the nth power. So it just counts the number of points and applies Q raised to that power. And then it's not hard to check that this R matrix preserves the total number of points appearing in a tensor product, which implies that this phi of Q tensored with itself commutes with the R matrix. And in this way, one associates some Baxter subalgebra, B of Q, inside this Yangian. We have some Baxter subalgebra, this algebraic object, and just like we've found every other algebraic object geometrically, it'd be nice to have a, a geometric description of this, and, and indeed we do. So it's a theorem of Mollick and Akunkov that these Baxter subalgebras B of Q can be identified with the algebra of uh, operators of quantum multiplication. In the cohomology of instanton moduli space. And so this identification gets one a large part of the way towards writing down explicit formulas for, for quantum multiplication 
and cohomology of these instant time moduli spaces. And so not only have we, have we kind of produced all this algebra geometrically, but it turns out that this algebra is, seems to be kind of the, exactly the right setting in which to, to study uh, the enumerative geometry of, of quiver varieties. Okay, so, so that's the kind of general picture. And now I want to see if we can push it a little bit beyond the setting of quiver varieties. So, question, what part of the story And a, a good place to start is instead of working with just Hilbert schemes of points on uh, C2 or ADE surface resolutions, which are quiver varieties, what if instead I look at the Hilbert scheme of points on a general surface? So there, there's some motivation for, for this question. So, so. Some motivation. Well, one are conjectural formulas of Oberdeek and Oberdeek and Pixton. For the quantum cohomology. of the Hilbert scheme of points on a K3 surface. So maybe if we can reproduce this algebraic package for an arbitrary surface, that can, that can help us pin down what, what these formulas should be. Um, another motivation, and um, I suspect this will, 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 similar kind of ideas will show up in Gertz's talk and, and Larker's talk, or, or to better understand universal structures for moduli of, moduli of schemes on surfaces, so in particular of the Hilbert scheme of points on, on a surface. So one will see that there are many structures on Hilbert schemes that don't depend so sensitively on the surface, but rather just on its um, churn numbers and, and other kind of numerical data of the, of the associated geometry. And a third reason why one might care, which I, I won't write down, but there's expected to be, especially in the, in the case of uh, k-trivial surfaces, almost no wall crossing between the cohomology of the Hilbert scheme of points on a surface and um, the DT or, or PT theory of three folds that are fibered in this, this surface over a curve. And so. And so this whole package can't be reproduced for arbitrary S. And in general, it seems unreasonable to expect that for the Hilbert scheme of points on a surface, one has some um, explicit identification between any Baxter subalgebra and, and any operator of quantum multiplication. So, so the whole package can't be re reproduced for reproduced for general S. But one, one, one still can construct an R matrix. And, and two, the matrix elements of this R matrix still encode in terms of, uh, they still encode multiplication by tautological bundles. It can be written in terms of tautological bundles. And in fact, one can modify this construction 
to get, so, so if you have a quiver variety, you, you have tautological bundles associated. If you have a surface with more bundles on it, then one, one has to any bundle on the surface an associated tautological bundle. And one can modify this construction to get uh, turn classes of, of those tautological bundles as well. So that is to say that, that the classical cohomology of the Hilbert scheme can be identified with a Q equals zero Baxter subalgebra of a Yangian. Associated to the Hilbert scheme of S. Okay. So yeah, what I'd like to explain is is how to construct this R matrix. Before I do that, are there any questions? So in what generality can we do this? So I want to start with some smooth quasi-projective surface. And I need to impose one assumption. So, so either we need S to be proper Or, I, and I suppose this first thing, the first case is a subcase of what I'm about to say, but where we need a torus to act on, on S. Such that the fixed locus is, is proper. And so the, the reason they need to impose this assumption so we can make sense of what it means to, to integrate over the surface. And so then, the equivariant cohomology of the surface, and I'll, I'll suppress dependence on, on uh, T from, from now on has the structure of a Frobenius algebra. That is, there's some pairing for cohomology classes on the surface. We can just integrate the product of cohomology classes. And if this S is, is non-proper, this, this integral is defined as some equivariant residue, but that's fine. And, and so this is uh, some, some algebra over equivariant cohomology of a point suitably localized. You may as well invert everything. And so if we have some torus action on, on S, then the torus also acts on the Hilbert scheme. points on S. And just as before, we can group all the cohomology of, of the Hilbert schemes to obtain some vector space. And this will be a Fox space for a Heisenberg algebra. labeled by elements of the cohomology of S. Okay. And so how does one construct this Heisenberg algebra? It's constructed by certain correspondences. So 
So just to fix the, the notation, in this triple product of two Hilbert schemes, I apologize. and the surface itself, I can associate the following locus. So given some, some integers uh, m and some positive integer n, I can look at the locus of subschemes such that one is, is contained in the other, and the support The difference in support of, of the two subschemes is contained entirely at a point. And then this triple product comes with three projection maps, one onto each factor. And I can define an operator going from the cohomology of the left to the cohomology of the right, as follows. So I take in some cohomology class X, I pull it back along this map P1, Then I take the cohomology class gamma that I've associated. Um, so, so here gamma, I should say, is a cohomology class of my surface. I pull back that class. Then I intersect with the class of this locus Y I've defined. And finally, I push the whole thing forward along this map, P3. Informally, all I've done is, is add a thick point of uh, length n along the Poincaré dual to this class gamma. And then for, for uh, these operators, they can be defined analogously or as adjoints. the operators have already defined. And so these operators are called creation operators. These alpha negative n and these alpha n are called uh, annihilation operators. And so as their uh, notation may suggest, it's a result of the Nakajima and independently Gronowski that these operators form a, a copy of the Heisenberg algebra with, with labels in the cohomology of my surface. That is to say that The, the supercommutator of two of these operators is zero if i plus j isn't zero. And otherwise is given by their pair. And then Vs can be thought of as a Fox space. For the algebra generated by these. For this Heisenberg algebra, let's say. Okay. 
So I have generators for, for all n positive and all n negative, but what happens when, when n is equal to zero? So what about these zero modes? Well, I can just add in some central element. for each cohomology class. And we can say they act by zero on the clock space. But this also gives us, these, these zero modes also give us an extra degree of freedom. So we can put the S into a family of evalua evaluation representations as we did before. Vs uh, u, where here u is some formal parameter. And now these, these zero modes will, will account for the appearance of this u. So that is to say, this A0 of gamma will act by a scalar U times the integral of this gamma, and it's convenient to include this minus sign. So that lets us deform this, this family of representations. So anytime we have a, a Heisenberg algebra, one can produce via the, the Fagan-Fuchs construction a Virasoro algebra. And so these Virasoro generators can just be written as quadratic expressions in the Heisenberg generators. And so how do we do that? Well, first, It'll again be convenient to, as we were earlier, introduce another formal parameter. Kappa. Actually, let me, let me, before, giving an explicit version of this, this Virasoro, let's, let's see how the Virasoro will, will arise geometrically. So let me, come, let me drop this for now and come back to it in a bit. Yeah. So, so I want, now what we want to do, so keeping that in mind, what we want to do is, is construct an R matrix acting in the tensor product of two of these Fox spaces labeled by two evaluation parameters. So how do we come up with this? Well, we, we look at when the construction in the case of uh, C2 and see if there's a way we can characterize it in terms of, of algebra. And so in the special case, when S is equal to, to C2, the stable envelope construction implies that this RU commutes with all operators that look as follows. If I take a Heisenberg tensor of the unit and a unit tensor of the Heisenberg acting on this tensor product, I see that, that RU commutes with these. And so to that end, let me try to generalize that feature to, to arbitrary surfaces. What I do is I set alpha plus n to be alpha minus n gamma tensor one plus one <laughs> Tensor alpha minus n gamma, and similarly, my 
to find these minus operators. Okay. And I can decompose this tensor product in terms of these two types of operators. That is, I also set Vs plus to be well, whatever field I'm working over. to be the collection of tensors obtained by applying these plus operators to the vacuum tensor itself. And Vs minus is defined similarly. And so one can decompose this tensor product in terms of Vs plus and, and Vs minus. And once one keeps track of what happens to the evaluation parameters, one gets the following. Okay. And, and so this statement here, that RU commutes with all of these alpha plus um, implies that, that when S is equal to C2, R of U restricted to this plus part, the resulting R matrix restricted to this plus part is just the identity. And so if we're going to try to generalize this construction to an arbitrary surface, we may as well imply that we may as well force it to act just in this second tensor factor here. And so how, so then the next question is how does um, R of U act on the second tensor factor? And again, this has some answer that, that can be generalized. And the answer will be in terms of this promised Virasoro algebra when S is equal to C2, and this can be generalized. And so what's the answer? Now let me write down the Virasoro algebra in terms of these generators, in terms of these Heisenberg generators alpha minus. So now I'm going to introduce a new parameter kappa and I'll set L and gamma kappa to be the following quadratic expression in the Heisenberg generators. It'll be a sum over all integers m of the normally ordered product, alpha m minus, alpha n minus m minus, applied to the co-product of, of gamma. So we mentioned that, that the cohomology of S is a Frobenius algebra. In particular, it has a co-product. I take the co-product of gamma, decompose it into tensor factors, and feed the first factor into alpha m minus, and the second factor into alpha n minus m minus. Then I'm going to add a term that depends on kappa. And finally, this won't be of particular importance, but there's a term that, that only appears when, when n is 0. Okay. 
And so this is some algebraic expression. It also arises geometrically when one takes the commutator of these Heisenberg generators with the boundary of the Hilbert scheme, or the, the first churn class of the tautological bundle. And indeed, these do form a copy of the Virasaur algebra. So if I commute two of these generators, what I get is the usual Virasaur relations now with cohomological labels. So this quantity in here, this Euler class of, of the surface minus 6 kappa squared, can be thought of as the, the central charge of this, of the representation. And then this Vs is a lowest weight representation. for, for um, the Virasoro and the, the conformal dimension is obtained by looking at how these, these zero modes act. And it, so, so now I guess this is my Vs minus. Okay. And, and it acts by this quantity. here can be thought of as the conformal dimension. So both the, the central charge and conformal dimension are quadratic functions of kappa. And so in particular, if I send kappa to, to minus kappa, I, uh, I get the same answer. And so what happens is, is one, has a represent, uh, one has an isomorphism that I'll call Rs minus. and goes from Vs minus to, to Vs minus, that just sends some product of these Virasoro with kappa applied to the vacuum to the same exact sequence of, of generators, only now I replace my kappa by minus kappa. So I set and what I can do is I can set my, my R matrix to be the identity on this Vs plus part tensored with R S minus. And this will be some operator. acting on, on the tensor products of these representations. 
So in the remaining two minutes, let me state the punchline. So starting from this intertwiner of, of uh, VRSR representations, we've obtained some R matrix. And indeed, the theorem is that this R matrix satisfies the Yang-Baxter equation. And so the proof goes by reducing this, this argument for arbitrary S to the case of S2, or to the case of C2, rather, and then using the fact that uh, we have the stable basis construction for, for C2. So first, for C2, you have to match up this construction with a stable basis, and, uh, and then from there you can build up to general S. And then the second result is that this construction can be modified so that matrix elements of RU, that is, that is acting on the cohomology of the Hilbert scheme, can be written in terms of tautological bundles. So let's say given a line bundle L on S, the construction can be modified to produce an R matrix taking as input this line bundle, and given that line bundle, we can get matrix elements of the tautological bundle. And I just want to end by, by saying uh, some, some open questions. So, so one, is there an independent reason for this connection between the Virasara algebra and Yang-Baxter? So is there some alternative explanation. So if I do this Virasoro construction for C2, I happen to get an R matrix that matches up with what I get from this other stable envelope construction, and I know that from, from that stable envelope construction that I have Yang-Baxter. But it would be very nice if there were some uh, alternative or, or kind of more uh, higher level explanation as to, as to why one would expect Yang-Baxter to be lurking in, inside this Virasoro algebra. I don't know. And then a second question is, is what happens if I replace the cohomology of my surface by the cohomology of some higher dimensional projective variety or, or some other topological space. All we needed, the, the only kind of input used to define this vera sur algebra was the Frobenius algebra structure and cohomology of the surface. And so in principle, I could start with the cohomology of some larger projective variety or some larger variety with a torus action, run the same construction, and still ask at the end if I, if I satisfy Yang-Baxter. And, and I don't know. So, yeah, it would be interesting if this were some special feature of surfaces or if, if there, it should hold for more general classes of Frobenius algebras. And so I, I needn't even replace by, by cohomology of some variety. I could also replace um, by an arbitrary graded skew symmetric Frobenius algebra. And I could still define the Heisenberg, I could still define the Virasoro, and ask with, whether, whether what I get satisfies Yang-Baxter. I don't know. So yeah, I'll stop there. Thanks for your attention.